So let's talk about the Linux kernel and when it becomes relevant, right? And uh, in an attempt to do that, what we'll do is we'll imagine that we have a very simple system. Uh, so the system has a CPU, it has a DRAM, and right? so this is all of this is DRAM, and then it let's say has a ROM. Right? And then let's say it has the SSD, right? So let's briefly talk about what the Linux kernel is, right? What is the kernel? What should you imagine when we talk about kernel? So we'll keep the model very simple. We'll we'll keep you know we'll we'll ignore a lot of details and focus on like the fundamental things. So a kernel essentially provides us with a scheduler, and the scheduler manages processes. And the other thing that the kernel does for us is it allows us to manage hardware, right? So it allows us to manage hardware. And let's take a look at this part now. So let's say you have a machine, right? Let's say you have your workstation, laptop, something like that. And to that, let's say you have connected a camera. And so what we now want to do is uh, connect this camera over the USB and then fetch frames from within that camera, right? And this camera can be of any company, right? It can be from X, Y, Z, so on and so forth. And it would be fair to imagine that if you have the kernel running here, the kernel needs to know about what kind of camera this is. And once it knows about what kind of camera it is, it also needs to have some code that helps it manage this camera. My claim at this point is that that code which helps it manage this camera is called the driver. Right. We'll speak about this a lot more later uh, in other videos, but this is the notion of driver. So we are going to manage hardware using kernel drivers. Right. And so somebody needs to load it in and so on and so forth that, you know, we are going to take a look as part of this, uh, this series. But uh, this camera, hopefully you are convinced that there is a USB port here. Um, and then, you know, we need some code that can manage the USB port. And that's another, you know, kernel uh, infrastructure or again, driver, right? So something like that. All right. So this kernel then, is essentially we can think of it as it manages processes and it helps manage the hardware, right? Okay, so question then is, where is the kernel stored? So the answer to that is that the kernel is stored, uh, let's say, you know, as an image in the SSD. So, well, it's not really an image. It can be a bunch of files and so on and so forth. Uh, so essentially a bunch of files and that's the kernel saved in the SSD. That is important. Then the question is, but uh, you know, the executable code must come to DRAM. So the kernel needs to be loaded to the DRAM. And from the DRAM, the CPU will execute stuff. Okay. And then there is ROM and ROM is also connected or like the CPU can reach out to ROM and obviously CPU can reach out to the SSD. The question now we are wanting to explore is at what point does the Linux kernel come from here to here? So let's talk about what happens after power on. So we turn the power on and you know, a bunch of things happen and let's say the CPU is powered on. So the CPU, uh, essentially, what it'll do is it'll go to the ROM, fetch the code from there and start to execute. And what kind of code is available here? Uh, the code that is specific to that system which the system maker has provided. The system maker can be Intel, can be Lenovo, uh, it can be uh, you know uh, AMD, so on and so forth. So whoever creates that motherboard kind of a thing is the one uh, you know that will uh, they that uh, who are supposed to know uh, how this CPU is supposed to kind of you know boot up and proceed. So one of the things that the ROM code has is turning other things on, 
right and remember the dram needs to be turned on for the linux kernel to be copied here right and again you know go back and remember what the linux kernel does it's just for management of processes and it handles devices or you know it helps us manage hardware but this functionality is very generic right and uh, something like you know uh, which hardware to turn on when to turn it on during the boot uh, that the linux kernel will not know it's an abstraction think of linux kernel as an api that can do addition right so the thing that can do addition um, you know you need to first of pass it x and y that's one thing but the value of x and y needs to be decided by somebody else right so the linux kernel can do scheduling and management of hardware it can help you with that but someone needs to turn on the basic hardware that the kernel can sit on right or operate out of so that's dram so who will turn on the dram well you know some part of rom or later stages of the boot so you must have noticed that you know um, uh, when the system turns on it kind of well before the screen comes up it kind of goes ahead and checks if you know a ram is available if you know the timer is available so on and so forth and if something goes wrong you see a message on the screen saying hey you know there is no ram cannot boot further bye bye right so all of that kind of checks are coming from here and the rom code cannot be modified that is why this has like very bare minimum stuff that is absolutely necessary for any system to boot now once this happens towards the end of the rom code like as you know the rom, ROM code's execution comes to an end what the rom code will do is instruct the cpu to copy some other code into the dram and i should also mention that the, you know the rom code is involved somewhere in ensuring that the dram is turned on right so the dram is active by the time the rom code is exiting or the frequencies are set correctly and so on and so forth so dram is active rom code is exiting so the rom code will fetch some more code put it in the dram and then the cpu will execute that code and that code what it does is it kind of you know prepares more hardware uh, maybe you know it provides user with certain security configurations during the boot up the bios settings or the uefi or u boot environment that you guys would have seen uh, that is coming from this you know intermediate code so to speak so this code is essentially then you know offering user to select between oss and things of that nature all right and now what happens is this code as it is completing its execution as it is coming coming towards like an end it will copy over the linux kernel somewhere in the memory right uh, kernel and then what it will do is it will ask the cpu to go execute that kernel it's like hey whatever the kernel requires minimal hardware that i have enabled you know you can now go ahead and execute the kernel i have copied it in the ram for you right okay so now we also talked about that the kernel can handle certain hardware right it can, it can help us manage hardware now what happens is the kernel internally has lot of drivers right which the machine makers like lenovo if it has a lenovo camera on the laptop so these guys will ship or, or rather you know take their drivers and submit it to open source as part of the linux kernel so whenever you are booting up the linux kernel the linux kernel kind of has the driver for that particular camera already in most cases it does if it doesn't have you know we have to add the drivers much later that piece of hardware wouldn't be functional until that hardware is manually added much later but right now let's talk about the drivers that are already present so let's say something like the usb driver will already be present right so now the idea then is uh, the linux kernel got the control but it needs to know where the hardware is in fact what all hardware does your system have right and let's now add in more hardware here let's say we have two usb ports so someone needs to tell linux kernel information about 
what all hardware is available which is the make what is the hardware what driver to use for it some hint related to that is required and now comes the concept of something called DTB uh, which is called the device tree blob right so this is a data structure this is a data structure and this data structure in a tree-like fashion describes who is connected to whom what all uh, at uh, what all hardware is available at what memory address is it available so on and so forth so remember the the intermediate code the uefi or the uh, bios code that we were talking about so that code also passes some other information and there is like in SSD we'll have something else which is called the DTP and that DTP is also passed to the Linux kernel by this software here, the intermediate code here and this intermediate code by the way is called bootloader, right? So it is helping in the boot stages uh, you know prepare the machine for the OS and so the bootloader essentially passes so bootloader passes you know the kernel the DTB okay. and how does it pass so it simply says hey CPU I'm going to go now you know my time has come but remember uh, to fetch the code from this X address in the memory that's where I have put the Linux kernel for you and oh by the way uh, you know also save this information about why and if the Linux kernel needs it it'll come and look and where is this Y information stored it's stored within a few of the registers uh, or one of the registers let's say R1 of the CPU so CPU has some internal registers which it uses for bookkeeping so one of the registers or like you know 64 bit worth of memory um, that kind of stores the address of where the DTB is loaded so you can now imagine that as we turn the laptop on you know the boot code or the boot ROM code is executed first certain basic checks are done you know, RAM is present or not uh, XYZ power supply is enough or not so on and so forth once those checks are done the boot ROM copies over the bootloader right copies over this bootloader and puts it in the DRAM and DRAM is also activated by the boot ROM so the DRAM is ready the bootloader is loaded there the bootloader goes about turning a lot of things uh, you know on collecting some initialization information and then it com composes or copies over this DTB uh, puts it in the location in DRAM, copies over the Linux kernel, puts it in the DRAM and before it exits, it passes CPU that information. It sets, so to speak, the program counter to the Linux kernel address and it loads one of its internal registers uh, with the information about where the DTB is. And once these, uh, once the DTB information is available and the Linux kernel starts to boot, the Linux kernel reads the DTB and figures out, uh, okay, which USB port, who is the maker of it, what is the driver, do I have the driver, if I have it, run it, right? So that's how we have the Linux kernel booting up. And if it has the device drivers, it will use those. If not, uh, you know, it needs to be manually loaded. And as part of... Uh, this journey um, part of this series here we are going to focus on how to write a device driver and assume that you're writing it for a hardware um, that is right now not released in the market so you're writing that device driver submitting it to the linux source and while it is submitted to the linux source the hardware is released to the public so as the public you know gets a new laptop downloads the linux kernel and installs and runs it the driver is already available and the hardware just works right so that is the idea and one thing that i want you to remember about linux kernel as a mental model is the linux kernel is simply doing process scheduling and it's also doing hardware management and the drivers part typically comes when we are talking about hardware management and before we go remember i mentioned that the linux kernel is like the add api for example which adds to number x and y uh, you can imagine 
instead of you know maybe x and y is just let's say y and it simply adds y plus one and returns back so this y you can think of as the dtb it's a parameter to the linux kernel that it needs to be able to understand what all hardware is available right so with this we kind of have the imagination and the mental models that we need in terms of reason about you know device drivers and start to develop the code so with this i'll see you in the next one